have a captive audience, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Cornell Clayton. I'm the director of the Foley Institute here at WSU. And on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome you out to our lecture this evening. We're fortunate to have with us one of the uh, leading experts on American politics and American society, Theda Scotchpole. She is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University, where she has also served as the Dean of the Graduate School and the Director of the Center for American uh, Political Studies. Professor Scotchpole is an internationally recognized scholar. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the National Academy of Sciences. She was born and raised in Michigan and received her BA from Michigan State University and her PhD from Harvard University. <coughs> Professor Scotch Pole's work covers a wide range of topics and is widely cited in political science, history, and sociology, and has received numerous awards throughout the years. During the last two decades in particular, her research has focused on healthcare reform, public policy, and civic engagement amidst shifting inequalities in American society. Among the many books she has authored or co-authored are States and Social Revolutions, Diminished Democracy, Healthcare Reform in American Politics, and the Tea Party and the Remaking of American Conservatism. In addition to her teaching and research at Harvard, Professor Scotchpole co-founded and serves as the director of the Scholars Strategy Network, which is an organization with dozens of chapters nationwide and encourages nonpartisan public engagement by university scholars and the building of ties between academics, policymakers, and civic groups. Outside of her academic work, Theta is a devoted NFL football fan. Unfortunately, I learned she's a big fan of the New England Patriots, so we won't hold that against her here in Seattle. A lot of respect for the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> she's also a frequent visitor to antique malls. We were talking about that earlier where she looks for various kinds of Americana, including old membership ribbon badges and union, uh, from unions and fraternal associations. Join me now in welcoming Theta Scotchpole. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. This is a very, very beautiful part of the country, and I don't happen to have had the pleasure of visiting Pullman before. So I look forward to our discussion when I finish uh, my remarks. Um, let me start by saying that uh, I, I'm a historical social scientist, but history happens now, too. And in recent years, I've been studying, along with my colleagues, the you know never dull uh, junctures uh, that, that, that have been happening in the swirling um, uh, American politics of our time. Some years ago, the work on the Tea Party and its emergence was an attempt to understand what was happening at the grassroots as well as nationally among conservatives during a period when uh, briefly the Democrats controlled the presidency in both houses of Congress. And now we're in another moment where, uh, in a very different direction, um, we see um, uh, the Republican Party controlling uh, the presidency in both houses of Congress and um, new kinds of social movements stirring at the grassroots uh, on the center left. So. Um, part of the work that I'm doing that I won't talk about today is trying to track what's happening in this current moment by, along with colleagues at Harvard, we're visiting um, eight counties where people voted for Trump uh, repeatedly over the next two to four years, two apiece in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin, trying to get to know the local leaders across the entire partisan spectrum, the business leaders, the civic leaders, and the people leading various kinds of social movements on the left and right. So uh, we're in a moment where uh, there's constant discussion of the Trump presidency. I'm sure that will come up in the discussion period. But um, I'm going to be talking about a different strand of work uh, that I've been doing with colleagues that also speaks to the Trump presidency, but in a different way. The work that I did on the Tea Party, I think, helps me at least understand what some of the sources of popular anger and support for uh, Trump um, have been. Uh, but there are also very powerful elite forces uh, in and around the Republican Party that uh, whatever their degree of enthusiasm about Trump, and in some cases it's not much, are nevertheless trying to use the juncture of this presidency and the Republican control of Congress to accomplish some in their view, vital redirections of American government and public policy. So 
Um, the second part of the, the part of the work that I'm going to talk about today is, is partly helps to illuminate some of those elite forces around the Republican Party. What is it? Uh, uh, I've already messed things up. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. So this work is uh, 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 that I'm going to talk about today is a piece of the findings of a project called the Shifting Terrain Project. Most political scientists use attitude surveys or studies of Congress or other kind of large quantitative data sets referring to individual actions to track what happens in American politics. My research colleagues and, and, and I are taking a look at organized groups in American politics, how they raise and deploy resources, and how that has shifted during a period where the Republican Party has really realigned its positions in many ways from what I remember just a decade ago, and um, um, the kinds of issues uh, that are being debated and legislation that's being debated at the national level and in many states is radically different. So part of the questions that I'm trying to explore in this larger project are what explains the Republican shift toward ultra-right positions, <coughs> particularly on the economy. I'm not going to talk about immigration, ethno-nationalism, racial politics at all in, in these remarks. I'm going to talk instead about the dimension of politics that has to do with the role of government in the economy. And it is a fair thing to say, I believe, that Republicans in general have <coughs> moved toward saying that government should get out of the economy. There should be less regulation, regulation should be dismantled, taxes should be radically cut back, uh, unions should not have legal rights, um, the government should not be involved in environmental or labor relations regulation. And these are positions that Republicans have always tended to have, all the way back to Eisenhower, but now they have them in a much more absolute and much more extreme way that I am going to say is extreme, not because I'm making a comment politically, but because the positions do not align with what most people in the public, and in many cases most ordinary Republican voters, would prefer. And I'll just give by way of an example so you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> we just came within a situation in which only by one vote did Republicans fail to enact an approach to health policy that only 20% of Americans said they liked. So whatever was driving that, it's not popular preferences. The reason that our group focuses on organizations is that we think the standard focus on polls, presidential contests, and even individual wealthy donors misses a lot that goes on when you focus instead on enduring organizations that raise and channel resources to affect not just elections, but the issues that are debated and the kinds of legislation that comes up for enactment in Congress and across the states. And what we've done in this project is to try to understand the changes in organi organized politics at the national and cross state level since the 2000s. So that means just the last 15 to 20 years. I'll give you the bottom line and then proceed to work through it. The bottom line is that things have really shifted on the right. The Republican Party in many ways does not directly control a lot of the resources on the right and many <coughs> resources are controlled by an integrated political network called the Pope Network that has pulled the Republican Party toward these ultra-free market positions on economic issues through a combination of carrots and sticks for candidates and elected office holders. Now, this is data that the political scientists in the room will recognize. There are people at Princeton University who have been doing scores for a long time that enable us, particularly on issues that have to do with the role of government in the economy, that's the dimension that's on this graph, to uh, track uh, you know, uh, uh, the relative liberalness or conservativeness of Democrats and Republicans, in this case in the House of Representatives. Now, 
partisan polarization, the pulling away of the two parties from one another, has been going on for a long time. You can see that in this graph. But it, it has unfolded in two phases from the 1960s to the 1980s, that is during the era in which the Civil Rights Revolution gave African Americans the right to vote and changed party politics in the South, uh, it was a process of sorting out that could be called symmetrical. Democrats gathered more of the moderates and the liberals, where, where conservatives in the Reagan era were gathering more of the moderate to, to, to conservative people. Uh, I mean, I meant moderate to liberal among the Democrats. And you can see that they were pulling apart roughly in parallel. But starting in the 1980s and the 1990s, it's really the Republicans who are galloping off into the Netherlands there, uh, where the Democrats have mm, ooched a little bit toward the left. Um, so that's part of the puzzle that we're trying to understand in this work. And of course, this has all happened in a period where inequalities of wealth and income have also skyrocketed. Part of our research focuses on the meaning of that skyrocketing of economic inequality. Um, most of the research shows that the gains from the American economy have gone very disproportionately to the very top wealth holders and income earners, to the top 1%, actually the top 1% of 1%. Uh, so there are many more millionaires and billionaires, and Adam Bonica at Stanford University shows that they have become more politically active during this period. And by the way, politically active on the left as well as the right. It is not the case that only that wealthy people only are active on the right. They are also active on the left. A lot of political scientists are interested in that, and they tend to try to study it by identifying individual wealthy people and using public records of donations to candidates or to uh, party committees to figure out um, the relationship between the characteristics of the wealthy donors and the people that they're giving to in elections. We think that's important in our research group, but we think there's another thing going on that's even more important, and that's the emergence of donor consortia organize groups of millionaires and billionaires that meet repeatedly and concert their political giving, not just for elections, but to influence other political organizations. Think tanks, constituency mobilization groups, uh, the parties, um, and, 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 and to, in a sense, set the agendas of legislation, the things that come up for today, and influence what gets enacted in between elections. So our research, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, looks at the organized fat cats, to put it closely. And we think that in our era, although not only in our era, there are these donor consortia that I'll define in a minute. The most important ones operating today are the Koch seminars on the right and the Democracy Alliance of Millionaires and Billionaires on the left, the progressive left. We have gathered data on, um, and these are secretive organizations and they have not handed us their membership lists, but we have our ways and we've put together some fairly complete lists and we have, so I'll present some data on who these people are um, uh, as individuals. But the much more interesting part of the work is what they do when they get together to raise funds and where their organized groups, the Koch Seminars and the Democracy Alliance, direct those resources to change the organizational terrain of politics as a whole. Um, so we're particularly interested in how these organized groups of wealthy people raise and deploy resources to affect the larger political landscape. And we think that part of what we found helps to make sense of why this rightward tilted um, polarization is happening. Okay, so just to introduce the players here, um, twice a year the wealthy donors on the left and right meet in very posh hotels or resorts. This was, this, and we have the programs from these meetings and analyze the programs. The programs are great. This is the Spring 2014 Investment Conference, that's what it's called on the left. It was held in an entire floor 
of a luxury hotel in Chicago. Not to be outdone, the Coke <laughs> seminars was held in an entire resort in Southern California that was rented and surrounded by military style security for the several days that their meeting was held a little later. And you see the title of the meeting. That one was called American Courage. How much courage does it take um, to go to them? <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that's interesting in this research is where these groups have met. Um, in recent years, the Democracy Alliance is meeting in urban settings. But they used to meet in resorts just like this. And the Koch Seminars and the Democracy Alliance have sometimes met in the same resorts, although never at the same time. <laughs> All right, so what are these mega donor consortia? We think they have a number of features that make them different from your, your ordinarily political action committee or a single donor, like, say, Tom Steyer or uh, even the, the Mercers. They encourage their organizations that these wealthy people join as members. Uh, there are membership rules. Uh, you have to pledge to give at least $200,000 a year to join the Democracy Alliance, and you have to pledge to give 100000 and we believe it's really 200000 when you count couples, uh, to join the Koch seminars, and they almost all give more than that. And, you, so there's, and then, then there's dues on top of that, and you also have to pay your travel and your, your time at those wealthy resorts. So it's not a small commitment to even get in the door. Um, the organizations encourage continual giving year after year, at least at that minimum, by their members. So that means they can pursue strategies that involve a time horizon beyond individual elections. That's very important uh, for in terms of having impact in politics. They focus on a wide range of political endeavors and policy issues in both cases. They're not policy specialized at all. They focus on supporting other organizations, not just candidates or politicians. And they have a major social component because, of course, these meetings that go on for several days, there's lots of wine and dining, there's lots of schmoozing, it's, and people see each other again and again, and they build up ties. And both consortia are, are also now or, or organizing regular meetings in major urban centers so that their members can socialize in between. Um, the, the, uh, the winter and, and spring or summer meetings. Um, just the overall picture. The Democracy Alliance on the left has partners, and um, the partners can be individuals, they can be family units. Um, in recent years, they can be institutions like unions. And so it's not all that easy to translate that into people. We worked out a, a, a way of, mul of, of taking the partner units and multiplying by 1.5 to get our best approximation. But I wouldn't take the level here as seriously as the trend. You can see that they started out strong and then they leveled off very fast. The Koch seminar attendance is reported um, in the newspapers by muckraking journalists. Recently it's reported directly. I mean, uh, the Koch seminars are no longer pretending that they're secret. They're just tell us you know, um, twice a year. And you can see that their attendance has gone is now at the 550 level. Um, if you translated that into family units, since people tend to come as Mr. and Mrs. Ohio widget manufacturer, um, you, would, you would maybe want to cut that in half. But the trend is clearly much more sharply upward um, on the right. Where do they live? Well, I don't think this should surprise anybody. The progressive millionaires and billionaires are crowded on the East Coast in the Acela Corridor and on the West Coast from Seattle down to San Diego. There are some blue dots there in Texas and in Colorado, but it is the uh, uh, Koch Seminar attendees who are much more spread out uh, over the country uh, than the, the left-wing uh, mega-donors. The industries in which the fortunes were made. We tried to match up the names we have with information on the sources of uh, either uh, active wealth for those who remain active in business, are much more likely to be on the right, or those who are 
heirs of fortunes that were made uh, in business. And you can see, uh, won't surprise anybody, I think, that uh, they both have a hefty representation from Wall Street. Wall Street is in both places. But otherwise, it's a very different profile. Many more people in <coughs> manufacturing and mining uh, among the right-wing um, uh, wealth holders that are in, these, in the Coke seminars, and much more likely to be in information technology, health, uh, the arts. Um, uh, we are continuing this work, and I suspect we'll find many more heirs of wealthy fortunes on the left than um, on the right. We have done a little bit of work on the electoral giving of these individuals. It's not our major focus, but Adam Bonica at uh, Stanford University has put together a database of all the donations given all the recorded donations given to zillions of politicians for many years. And so we went through the painstaking work of matching our names to his database. That's not easy because a lot of times people are known by their nicknames. So there will be multiple names for each person and we could have a computer help us, but we had to do it by hand in the end. And the question there was whether uh, there's a pattern of polarization happening in the kinds of politicians that the right and left donors give to. And although it's not obvious from this scattergram, when you do statistical tests, there is a slight significant effect of polarization. So there's some reason to believe that participation in these groups may pull the donors toward giving to more uh, liberal progressive or more uh, right-wing uh, candidates. We're continuing that work, and one nifty thing that we've done, and I can't, I'm not presenting today, but we've, um, we've discovered the names of politicians that appear at the, at the meetings and look to see whether their donations bump up uh, right after they do appear. And for those who were unknown at the time that they appeared at, say, the Koch seminars, someone like Joni Ernst, who was a state uh, representative when she appeared at the Koch seminars, her donations went way up uh, right after uh, from the wealthy uh, members. So probably these groups are helping to build recognition for uh, candidates that get attention, and candidates want to attend these meetings. Um, they are not always invited, but they really want to be there, and you can imagine why. All right, so here's the most, most interesting part. The most interesting part of our work is involved taking a look at how much money is raised and how it's, how it's deployed to other political organizations on the left and right. And we start by analyzing what happens at the meetings. We have a complete run of programs for all of the Democracy Alliance conferences from 2005 to the present. I'm not going to present all that today, but that's a gold mine because we know all the groups that have appeared, all the sessions that have been held, all the organizations that have been featured in those meetings. <coughs> Obviously, on the right, we don't have the same information for the Cokes, but journalists lurk around these meetings, and people make mistakes. They drop packets of materials, or they leave a crumpled up document in their hotel room. And it seems that Mother Jones is always on the case on the <laughs> left, and the Washington Free Beacon is always on the case on the right. Some of our most imp important information about the Democracy Alliance was found when Jonathan Soros, of all people, dropped an entire packet of financial information on the floor of the hotel at the spring 2014 meeting, and it was picked up by a Washington Free Beacon journalist. As a political scientist, I love muckraking journalists, and I don't care whether they're on the left or the right, because we have collected all of this and put it in spreadsheets. We have it all. And we have two complete programs for Koch seminar meetings in the spring of 2010 and the spring of 2014. These are both very important junctures just before key midterm elections. And we have the counterpart meetings for the Democracy Alliance at those same <coughs> times. So these points are from that analysis. The Koch seminars are highly choreographed affairs. 
They start with a speech from Charles Polk explaining why people need to have the courage to save America from Barack Obama and from liberalism. And they uh, have sessions to, to uh, inform new people joining what the Koch seminars are all about. So they're, they're, they're socialized into the organization and its purposes. And then the rest of the sessions tend to unfold in a way that lays out a coherent political strategy for uh, not just the next elections, but for influencing the way Americans think about politics and for influencing the long run of what government does. Uh, so they have a very fixed choreography and most of the people who appear on the panels are people from other political organizations that are run by Koch uh, connected people. The Democracy Alliance conferences, on the other hand, are like a big American political science association. For those of you who've been to, you know, you know at the American Political Science, everybody's walking around looking for someone important. <laughs> uh, actually, it used to be more that way, now everybody's looking at their screens. But when they look up, they're looking for somebody important to schmooze with. That's what the Democracy Alliance is like, because the meetings include not just the wealthy donors, but the dozens of professional leaders of the groups that are begging for money, I mean, asking for money <laughs> from the wealthy donors. And so the panels are packed full of people representing all the groups that are looking for money, and the uh, halls are full of people looking for uh, donors to take a side for uh, a more a convincing private discussion. There is no socialization of new members. There's just a welcome cocktail party. It's sort of assumed that if you join, you already know what's happening. There's a lot of discussion about how progressive we are, but there's no definition of what progressive means, and there is absolutely no master strategy that is presented during the meetings. Okay. Now, part of it is a difference in money. Paralleling the different trends I presented earlier and the numbers of people who are members, the amount of money that's raised through the Koch seminars has burgeoned over the years, whereas the DA donation totals that are reported as meeting the pledges of the members stayed relatively flat. But we're much more interested in our research on where the money is spent rather than how much it is. So uh, let me spend a little bit of time on these uh, figures because they're very, very important. They're pie charts. It just so happens because Jonathan Soros dropped that file and because we have access to some reporting that happens from the Coke uh, Network's uh, Freedom Partners organization to the, to the uh, IRS, the tax people, that we have a pretty good picture of the direct political allocations for 2013 and 14. And on the left is the um, pie chart for the Democracy Alliance. It shows that um, a total of 144.6 million was raised by partners reporting donations that meet their membership pledge or exceed their membership <laughs> pledge. And um, 32 million of that, 38, 33 million, went to eight longtime uh, organizations that have been recommended to DA partners again and again as a good place to give their money. I mean, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but things like the Center for American Progress, Media Matters for America, the Center for Community Change, um, Basic America Votes. Basically, mainstay organizations of the Democratic Party, and particularly the presidential wing of the Democratic Party. Um, another 26 million went to 23 more organizations that, at one time or another, have appeared on the yearly lists that DA partners are given of groups that they should seriously consider for their donations. The core recommended list. As you can imagine, organizations vie to get on that list because if you're on it, you're more likely to get some money from the DA partners. So there are a lot of other organizations that have come and gone beyond those long time ones, and they got a fair chunk of money. 
But the Democracy Alliance also has a huge list of over a hundred groups that if you don't want to give, if you're a wealthy member and you don't want to give to the really recommended groups, you can give to one of these other ones and it counts. Um, and so every wealthy person has several groups that they want on that larger list. It's called the Progressive Infrastructure Map. And that big green chunk there is all the money out of the 144 million that went to those kind of, I call them the goats, not the sheep. But you have to have read the Bible to know uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, in any event, to all the other groups that are okay. Now, by contrast, look at what happens through Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce, which is the core conduit for the Coke Network. Um, that takes the money that the people give. They give it directly to the Koch Seminar uh, organization, Freedom Partners. And the Democracy Alliance people give their money directly to the organizations and then report that they've done that. But in the, in the Koch uh, operation, people give directly to the organizations, but they also give to Freedom Partners. And Freedom Partners uh, gave 20% of the money that it hauled in in 2013-14 to 26 conservative organizations. Yeah, a little bit to the NRA, a little bit to the Chamber of Commerce, a little bit to Right to Life. Uh, not much, just bits and pieces. But 80% of the money went to directly Coke-run organizations. Now, what are those? Let me just uh, find that for you. This is the core Coke political network. These are the organizations that the 80% of the money went to and that most of the money that's raised. These are organizations that over the years have been created and directed by David Koch, <coughs> Charles Koch, or people immediately tied to them. Um, they started back in the 1980s supporting ideas organizations. Uh, the, the Cato Institute, the Mercatus Center, uh, and the Charles Koch <coughs> Foundation, which to this day gets a lot of grants to university-based pro projects around the country. Then they moved on to issue-oriented groups, uh, particularly to fight climate change legislation, to try to dismantle Medicare, um, fight health care reform bills. Uh, only in the 2000s, though, did they take the leap into creating a, an integrated political machine that rivals the Republican Party in the size and scope of what it does. The Koch seminars were the key to funding that because the brothers are not giving the money directly. They're getting other wealthy people to give most of the money. It's channeled through Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce. And much of it goes to Americans for Prosperity. Now, I don't want to go too long, so I'm going to leap to the point here. When you look at the shift of organizational resources on the right from 2002 to 2014, you see that what's happened in that short period of time is that Republican Party committees control much less of the money, the budget money, that right-wing organizations have, conservative organizations have. And non-party funders, constituency organizations, and think tanks control more. And most of those new ones are listed in blue here. The bottom part of the list are groups that came into existence after 2002, but were important by 2014. And if their names are in blue, they're part of the Coke network that I described. So they're not the only ones where the extra party money has gone on the far right, but they are the most important ones. And above all, they're the ones that are getting the bulk of the new funding. And the linchpin of the Koch network is what I think of by now as America's third major political party. It's an organization called Americans for Prosperity. How many people here have heard of it? It was launched in 2004. It's a very cleverly structured organization. 
it's not a professionally run office in Washington or New York that just tries to influence Congress or the media. That's what most left-wing organizations are out there, apart from the labor unions. Instead, it has paid directors and paid staff in, by now, 36 states out of the 50. Uh, and by the time Barack Obama became president, it had paid directors and staff in 15 states, including dark ones here are the ones that are the earliest. And you can see that they weren't all just Texas and Oklahoma or Kansas. They were places like North Carolina, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio. Uh, by now, in many of these states, there are actually three tiers of organization. There are state directors, there are grassroots directors, there are lobbying people, and there are offices in various parts of the state, so that there's three levels of organization. Most of the money that's raised uh, for political purposes, not just educational purposes through the Coke Network, is channeled to Americans for Prosperity. And in the last year, the two standalone organizations focused on mobilizing Latinos and young people have been folded into Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity is really a new and strikingly innovative creation in American politics. It combines the kind of central direction that you would expect from a corporation. And when leaders don't do a good job, they are replaced with no fuss and no muss and very quickly. But it is federated, just like the American political system so that it can influence politics at the congressional and national level and in the state legislatures. And in the states, it works closely with the state policy network of right-wing think tanks and with American Legislative Exchange Council, which has members, uh, mostly Republican members, in the various state legislatures throughout the country. Uh, it maintains a very disciplined focus on advocating for tax cuts. They're very active right now pushing for a tax cut that has not even been written yet uh, in Congress. Uh, opposition to business and environmental regulations, cuts in social spending. They led the fight to prevent the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act by the various states. And they've taken active steps to weaken public sector unions because, and this is something that Tim Phillips, the head of AFP, directly says, they see the public sector unions as their direct rivals, because they too have a presence in communities and at the state level as well as national. The final question that we've pursued in our research is how, how does this cult network and Americans for Prosperity relate to the Republican Party? On the one hand, it's outside the Republican Party. It raises resources and controls those resources without passing them through the Republican Party committees without checking in with Mitch McConnell or um, Paul Ryan about how to spend the money. Uh, so it's an independent force. But it's also closely intertwined with the Republican Party. And in this part of our research, what we've done is to forget about tracking the money. You can't track all the money anyway. A lot of it's secret. We track the people. So what we've done is to reconstruct all of the people who became directors at the state level of Americans for Prosperity in the first 15 organized states. They have a long track record. And ask where did each person come from before they were a state director at Americans for Prosperity, a very important position. And where did they go afterwards? And what we find is that they are often pulled out of congressional or state legislative staffs or the staffs of Republican candidates for higher office. And then they have a time in the Koch organizations. If they do very well, if they do badly, they disappear. Mm -hmm. Those are the hardest ones to track because their names are no longer mentioned uh, in the uh, in the Koch network materials. But uh, And we do this from the Wayback Machine in the internet. Um, <coughs> But their names just disappear. But if they are successful, they move on to higher level positions in the cult network. So there's an internal career line that can lead you to regional 
uh, offices and, um, and national positions in the Arlington office. But a lot of them ultimately returned to Republican Party politics on the staffs of governors, presidents, and in fact, a lot of them are now in the Trump White House and in the Trump administration. Even though David and Charles Koch don't really like Donald Trump and didn't endorse him during the 2016 election. But this is the point I want to end with. By building a powerful, disciplined, resource-laden operation that parallels and is intertwined with the Republican Party across many states and nationally, the Koch Network is in a position, and by the way, I am not suggesting that they are doing anything illegitimate here. But please don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm describing it. Americans have the right to organize. They have the right to be smart in how they spend their money. And they have the right to be dumb in how they spend their money. And there's a lot of dumb spending of money going on on the left if you take their objectives seriously. On the other hand, the Koch Network set out to change the agendas of the Republican Party, to pull it toward ultra-free market positions that the Koch brothers believe, as a matter of principle, are the right positions. It's not just economic self-interest. And they have done it in a brilliantly effective way, because what they've done is created a series of ways to, to get people who've worked with them into key positions in the Republican apparatus, at the same time that they're providing ideas, political advertisements, <coughs> and volunteers at the grassroots level for election campaigns to get people elected in the Republican Party. And I'm going to stop because I want to open the floor for discussion. But we have carried the research to the final step in the sense that now that we have data on the COVID uh, operation through Americans for Prosperity, we're able to enter some of the data into statistical models to see whether, in fact, having an organized state director uh, makes a difference above and beyond just Republicans in a state or uh, public opinion in a state in certain key political outcomes. And um, we have uh, shown that the wave of anti-public sector union laws that passed after 2011 cannot be explained as well by simply looking at union strength, public attitudes toward unions, uh, or the numbers of Republicans versus Democrats in various state legislatures, as you can explain it if you have all those variables and you know whether Americans for Prosperity had a paid director in that state, which is a key institutional measure. Um, so impressed was the Koch Network with our research that they cited it in their recent donor prospectus. And they said it was scholarly research, and that's exactly what it is. It shows that uh, Americans for Prosperity makes a difference. And we've, we've done similar statistical models and case studies to show that Americans for Prosperity, working with Americans for Legislative Exchange Council and the free market think tanks, has made a big difference in the wars within the Republican Party that have occurred over Medicaid expansion in uh, uh, dozens of states in the last few years. In general, in those wars, the Chamber of Commerce often favors Medicaid expansion because it's money from the federal government that goes to health businesses. But the, uh, as a matter of principle, Americans for Prosperity, other Koch organizations, and the right-wing think tanks oppose Medicaid expansion. And we have statistical measures of their strength, and we have shown that that, that explains that the Republican states that refused to proceed with the expansion, even when governors, Republican governors, and chambers of commerce uh, supported it. So let me stop there and simply say um, that um, this, is what, this is a picture of what the Republican Party looked like in 2004 and now. This picture comes from the Democracy Alliance. 
Well, the interesting thing about these organizations of wealthy donors is that they are eyeing each other all the time. And sometimes they are imitating one another, although their ability to learn lessons from one another is imperfect. Um, back in 2004, the person who puts together these kinds of pictures at the Democracy Alliance had that part that's just the blue and white circles as a description of what the Republican Party universe was like. And that's not wrong. In many ways, the Republican National Committee and Carl Rove, Ralph Reed, and their organizations were at the core. But now the picture has to include these various extra party organizations uh, that met, make up that chair on the far right. Some of them are not folk organizations, but the most uh, uh, resourceful and the most effective in policy battles are definitely uh, the folk uh, network organizations. So let me stop there. This is my picture from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, showing America's three major political parties. <laughs> they all have offices on Main Street in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. The Democrats, the Republicans, and Americans for Prosperity. And Americans for Prosperity and the Republicans are right across the street. <laughs> <laughs> to take questions on anything that... Yeah, so we have about 20 minutes or so for questions. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should collect a few and I should try it. Otherwise, I'll talk on and on. As a question. <laughs> maybe I'll start off with one. Um, I'll answer going. yours correctly. So, <laughs> so um, one of the things you didn't talk about that, that, that has been in the news lately is the Koch brothers' strategy for reorienting some of the research done at universities. Yep. Uh, down at the University of Utah, Kentucky, elsewhere, that get major donations to business colleges with strings attached. So, so did you come across that in your research? That, that yes, I mean, uh, you know that pie chart that I gave that, that compared uh, the roughly similar amounts going to direct political organizations in 2013-14, that's only half the money raised through the Koch centers. The other half tends to go through uh, particularly the Charles Koch Foundation and uh, the Mercatus Center. And the, the Charles Koch Foundation has become much more active in the last few years in uh, trying to seed projects in the universities. Now, if you believe Jane Mayer, and I, you know, I have a lot of admiration for Jane Mayer's work and I've used quite a bit, but I think she may overdo it at times. I mean, she and others have suggested that all of the money that is given through the Charles Koch Foundation has strings attached that are illicit. I don't know about you, but I've been in universities for a long time, and they tend to take money from wealthy people. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I can think of some pretty outrageous things that have happened at Harvard. I, I, I won't take a moment to detail them. But many of them had absolutely nothing to do with the Koch brothers. So um, I'm not sure. I, I think that we don't have the same kind of data. The, the, the Charles Koch Foundation does not need to report in the same detail as Freedom Partners does to the IRS exactly how much goes to what organizations. Although we may be, give us time. We'll, we'll shake loose some information. But you would need to know the pattern of the grant. Some of them are going to researchers. Some of my colleagues at Harvard are getting grants for their research. And, uh, you know, frankly, professors get grants for their research from all kinds of places. I don't personally believe that the source of the money is automatically corrupting. I think it's important for people to report where they get their grants from. And it's important for everybody in the scholarly community to hold each other to scholarly norms. But if that happens, you know, I mean, uh, it's not clear that the mere getting of a grant is evidence of control. Um, centers are set up, and sometimes universities have allowed um, inappropriate levels of control to outside donors. And I'm sure that is happening with some of the Koch efforts. But it isn't the first time it's happened, and it's, that doesn't excuse it. But what it means is that the lesson to be drawn is not that something completely unprecedented is happening here, but that the scale is uh, significant 
and that the need for scholars across the political spectrum to remain vigilant about basic scholarly norms, like having universities control appointments rather than external donors, is as, as important as it has ever been. Um, so I just don't have the same level of detail, but I can tell you that at least half of what's raised in those, uh, those seminar meetings goes to those educational endeavors. And more professors appear on the programs at the Koch seminars than do at the democracy events. Let me say that again. More <coughs> professors appear on the programs at the Koch seminars than do at the democracy events. So, uh, because the left donors, you know, they have all their professional advocates that they want to support, and they don't necessarily want to hear from independent scholars who are going to tell them things like my research tells them that they don't want to hear. I probably won't have very many friends in those circles after this work is published, but the way I feel about it is, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. I guess following directly from that, you mentioned that people on the left in the Democracy Alliance aren't really spending their money um, intelligently or strategically when compared to people in these COPE networks. Strategically would probably be the right word. Strategically. Could you kind of go into more detail about what you mean by that and why yeah. you think that might be? I skipped important? some of the slides and I think you know they're here so they can be. Um, when you have a situation where membership in the Democracy Alliance means you're pledging simply to give to organizations that are on a vast approved list, um, the structure of the situation, it's, it's structured like a market. Think about the irony here. These are progressives. They spend a lot of their time talking about getting the market regulated and even more of their time talking about getting big money out of politics. I, I just don't know how to process that one. That one just blows my mind. But they do. That's what they spend a lot of time talking about. And so they all have favorite sets of organizations, and they give money to keep those going. And because of the way the left in this country has worked for the last half century, there are many, many organizations out there. There are issue-specific organizations, there are identity group-specific organizations, the overarching organizations, the unions, have, have been pushed back. So um, there's way too many organizations chasing a limited amount of money. And the way the operation is structured, there's no room for any strategic planning. Now, I say that, in 2014, Gara LaMarche, formerly at the Atlantic Philanthropies, became the director of the Democracy Alliance. And some of their members recognized some of these kinds of scattering issues, that they were scattering the resources. And he has tried to build more strategy into the, for example, to redirect more wealthy donor money toward the states. But it's hard, because the structure of the organization, institutional rules matter, the structure of the organization really encourages autonomous decisions by each partner. And in fact, the, even the label partner implies membership in an investment firm. Um, the people in the Koch seminars are called guests, and they're called people who have the courage to help save America. And, um, and when they write about how, why they're there, they say that the Kochs have opened their eyes to a whole new way of doing things. Uh, I think in social science terms, what we could say is that the Cokes have succeeded in creating collective public goods <coughs> for wealthy people on the right and convincing them that they are good stewards of their money for purposes that are uh, presented in the meetings as both moral and economic. It's simply not a series of industrial seminars. It's, it's about how to further the cause of freedom in America. And I know a lot of people would just say, oh, that's just talk. I haven't had the chance yet to sit down and directly interview Coke donors. I hope to do that. I have a few leads. But in the last few years, Charles Coke has encouraged some of his donors to start writing op-eds, to come to be public about their participation. And, and we've collected all those op-eds. So we know what they say when they present themselves in public. 
And what they say is, we're proud to be part of this. We think it works better than the Republican Party. And it, it's, it's, it's saving America from, um, from doom. Well, doom. I mean, they think, they think a strong government role in regulating the economy and raising taxes from wealthy people to pay for social programs um, um, is, is the work of the devil. That's what they think. Yeah, I have a question about, uh, so you're talking about how, I was just wondering, are the rep what, so you're saying the Republicans are like getting a lot more far right? And that was like shown in the data, right? That, that first graph I yeah, showed. Yeah, first graph. So I was wondering if, if these institutes, if they're affecting the public like opinion on these issues and that's making the uh, Republicans want to represent that opinion more or if it's just their... I'm asking, I, 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 I am glad you asked that question because I skipped over this part. Um, now, I want to say that in the work that we've done on the battles over Medicaid expansion in the different states, and the battles over whether to cut back union rights, we include a measure of public opinion. So just to spell it out, when we're asking what determines whether a Republican-led state, apart from the fact that it's Republican-led, cuts back on public sector <coughs> union rights, and when I say cut back, pretty much eliminates them in those cases. Is that because the public in those states is anti-union? Well, the answer is no. The American public in general says in opinion polls that it supports union rights. And in the particular states where these cutbacks have occurred, the level of support for unions was higher than it was in states where it didn't occur. So we look at the question of whether it's just partisanship, whether it's just public opinion. Um, we even look at business and what business wants. And that's important because it's, it's really easy. You're making a very good question here. It's easy to lay out all these organizational things, but it's hard to say what difference they make and how they make that difference. Now, Americans for Prosperity definitely has volunteers in every state. It has paid staffers that go out and try to influence public opinion. It contributes to elections, and it contributes to campaigns like the campaign to, to eliminate the Affordable Care Act and the campaign that's just getting going now to cut taxes. Uh, for corporations. Um, so they do try to influence public opinion, and I'm sure they do influence conservative and Republican opinion in these states. But the data suggests that public opinion overall is not what is driving these things, and that the strength of the Coke Network matters, even when you take into account public opinion, and even when you take into account what business interests want, sometimes they fight with business interests about this. Um, they're delighted to hear that, by the way. That's why they quote our research in their surveys, in their prospectuses to donors, because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to do something above and beyond, just you know, massaging the latest public opinion with a few television ads or uh, electing yet another Republican. So, you know, they, they could be happy and they could be wrong, but we think they're happy and they're right. We've got more work to do. Thank you. In your research, have you, I'm sure you, have you, you began to touch on it just a little bit in the answer to the previous question, but it sounds like the Koch Foundation is not organized as like a, something we would commonly under understand of a 501c3 that files yeah, it's a private okay so it's a private foundation, a family not, foundation. not filing a, a, a 990 that you have access to. we do not have a 990 that lists the organizations they give to the same way and I don't think they even report like the Ford Foundation does where they list all their sure. journeys now you know maybe I have to say um, we're still on the hunt there, we, 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 we sometimes find places where things are reported that we didn't know. Sometimes we find states that require more reporting than the national does, and that opens up a whole new window for us. So if you find out something, email me, okay? <laughs> I'm not telling you that I know all the answers, and you can see why this research is fun. 
It's like a giant detective operation. And uh, it's serious. I'm not, I'm not telling you that we aren't rigorous here. We are. But we're not just sitting in front of a computer and going to the easiest available data set. We're putting together data sets. And the data sets we're putting together will be available to the profession that can do it for us. So then where I was getting at with 503 and structure and, and board structure, do you have, uh, it comes down to how are the funds, how are the funds directed? Who's really holding purse strings? Is there, is, does the Koch Foundation in particular follow a standard board structure? Oh, oh yeah, they do. And, and their people are the all, ground. they're all insiders in the Koch network. I mean, sure. we, we um, one of the things that happens is that, um, let's see, I, I have one document, one document that is one of my favorite was left crumpled up in a bed in, um, at the end of a meeting. And some maid handed it over to one of the left wing journalists. It's in a list of all of the organizations present at the meeting that were having one on one meetings with Coke uh, donors at the meeting. That happens, so we know, you know, which rich people were meeting with the heads of the Charles Koch Foundation, which ones were meeting with America for Prosperity, which ones were meeting with Libre, which was independent at that point, it's the Latino outreach operation. And that's a really valuable document because we know who the rich people are, we've got information on them. And so we could sort of see the pecking order. And I can tell you that at that operation, some of the most significant donors were meeting with the Koch Foundation and with Mercedes. So, and the programs that we have uh, for the most recent events suggest that ideas are a very serious part of what they are doing. And they've moved from investing just in Cato or Mercatus to trying to invest in a lot of academics. I think they were slow to figure out something that everybody in academia knows, which is that academics are easily, um, <laughs> They're not easily controlled, but the topics they take up are easily, um, i got to be careful. research something with a lot of funding. It's easy to affect the agendas of research by dangling money out there. That's one of the reasons why I have to tell you something about me. Throughout my entire career, I figure out what I'm going to do research on individually or through a research group, and I start it without applying for outside money before I do it. That's because I don't want to be influenced by the event, even the need to reframe. So I usually just, hell, I get the money from anywhere I can, including my own bank account. And just and I did this even as a young professor when I didn't have much of a bank account. And I just get the work going, get the agenda and the momentum set, and then people want to give to it. But that's not the normal process in academia. And so I think the ramping up of the Koch Foundation as a conduit for grants into academia is not doing anything illegitimate. It's not even doing anything unusual. It's just figuring out how academia works. We've got time for one more question. I was, uh, I was curious to what extent you saw a trend in the data toward an increased uh, international participation in terms of uh, attendance at the conferences or donations or in the rhetorical kind of data in terms of the, the pamphlets or the programs, um, a kind of uh, increased or a trend toward um, intervention and maybe like France or something like that? Uh, like is there a war for the soul of, sort of the world or just America? For the Koch seminars uh, and the Koch network, it's very focused on America. Um, now, you know, making sure government, the U.S. government doesn't do anything active about global warming. I didn't present those slides, but they've gotten most of the Republicans to sign on to the no climate tax uh, 
the, the journalist Dave Roberts has pointed out that the Republican Party is the only major conservative party in the liberal democratic world that is led by climate deniers. And that has definitely been a priority for the Koch uh, network, and so it has global ramifications. But, um, you know, it's been true for a long time that liberal <coughs> wealthy people and liberal foundations or foundations that have a, some liberals helping to, to direct them, are interested in saving the world. Conservatives have been interested in saving America. Okay, well, I'm afraid our time is up. You can see why she, uh, Professor Scott, will heads up an organization that is about bringing quality academic research to the general public. He's a, a wonderful teacher and a wonderful researcher. Um, join me now in thanking Professor Scott for.